One of the things that uh, we, we started off talking about to kind of lay the foundation for this series and to try to establish some things uh, that we want to communicate in the power and the, uh, the outflow of what's inside of us and bearing the fruit because so often we get this misperception and understanding misunderstanding that we're supposed to produce fruit in our lives and we started back in John 15 and the passage there where Jesus says abide in me and you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing and he doesn't say produce fruit but he says abide in me and you will bear much fruit. And if you missed any of the last several weeks, you can always go back and get caught up on our website, heritagechurch.org. You can download our app to any smartphone or mobile device. Take us with you wherever you go, get caught up. But one of the things that I want to make clear in the, the foundation of everything that we do from this point moving forward, uh, from where we've been and where we're going, is that as we look through this passage in Galatians 5 and where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And as we navigate through all of those graces and elements of the fruit of the Spirit, one thing that I wanted to clarify as we started was that it is a singular comment and a singular fruit. They're all the elements and the graces of that fruit. It's not fruits, it's not a list that we try to go through and check off and choose the ones we want and don't want or where we're better at than others. We've been given all of them. And God, when we talked at the very beginning about God putting his spirit in our hearts and being united with him, then the spirit of God is in us. And the fruit of that spirit, for us as believers, to bear the fruit just like any agricultural picture that you might, might try to think of, you can't, you can't bury and plant um, azalea seeds and expect tomatoes to grow, right? I mean, the fruit that bears on a vine is, it gets its life and the source from what is, it's rooted in. And so for us to know and understand that the Spirit of God is in us, and the character and nature of that spirit and, and, and the character and nature of God and to know that that's the power that we have to bear any hope of the fruit of the spirit. And so as we walk through, that, walk through this whole series and we look at um, these elements of the fruit of the spirit, my encouragement has been, and I know Craig shared this last week, and um, the, the thing that we want to kind of get settled because if we don't get this settled, we we think that we've got to produce something. But here's where kind of we, we we're taking off on this in, in regards to what bearing the fruit of the spirit is. This is the graphic for bear it all. Here it is: bearing the fruit of the spirit is an outflow of what's inside. So bearing the fruit of the Spirit is simply our lives being an expression of what is already in us. And what, all, what God has already done in us. And so we're on this path and this journey and this process of learning more about who we are. And so when we go into Ephesians and we see this verse here in Ephesians 1.18, it should make more sense to us. I mean, it, it has to me. When we read it, because he says, I pray, Paul's praying for us, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Our, eyes don't have, our heart don't, don't have eyes. But what he's saying is that the eyes of our heart be enlightened, the, that what God has done in us, that we become more aware of his work inside of us. And he says that we may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. And as we walk through these and, and we, we begin to, to navigate through an understanding of what that is that God has already done in us, today we're talking about patience. And although it may seem uh, extremely intentional on my part and can come across as somewhat manipulative that, okay, today's Father's Day, we're going to talk about dads, be more patient with your kids, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's not really... Uh, how this all worked itself out. Uh, we plan six, eight months in advance. Uh, and so this just kind of fell in line with the passage. And it just 
happened to be on Father's Day. And we are going to talk about patience and what that looks like in our lives. And in a small part, in relation to our kids. Because as parents, I think one of the things that tries our patience so often is our kids. And have you, any of you guys ever found yourself asking for more patience with your kids? God, give me patience. I've got one nerve left and he's on it, right? And then you ask for patience and then you find yourself amidst difficult circumstances where your patience is tried. For instance, in a convenience store and your kid asks you if they can get some candy and you say, yeah, sure. I think it'd be nice to treat them. And you find yourself standing for what seems like 45 minutes while your kid stares at the candy aisle. And they know good and well they get one of about three things every time they go. It's either the Sour Punch Kids, the Chewy Sweet Tarts, the Gummy Bears, or those, those uh, sour straws that are coated with sugar. And as they pull it out, it gets sugar everywhere and sticky and then their hair. and all. I, I digress. But that's, that's the, the process that we usually go through. It's one of those two or three typically, but they stand there and they stare. Because to them, as a small child, um, being able to get a bag of candy-coated gold is like, I mean, a teen, giving a teenager 100 bucks. They don't have a concept of money. They just know they're going to get some candy. But I have very little expression of patience when we're standing in those circumstances, if I'm going to be honest with you. And uh, I've uh, noticed that my wife, in those opportunities, is a lot more patient with my kids than I am. And she made the comment one time that she remembers being in a store with her grandfather and standing there and staring at the candy and thinking, I am glad my mom and dad aren't here because they'd be rushing me. But her grandfather patiently standing there waiting on her to pick out some candy. And that made a huge impression on her. And she remembers that. And so in those circumstances and times we find ourselves in those similar situations with our kids, then she's a lot more patient than I am. And I think her remembering that is an important element as we move forward in some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Because if I'm going to be honest with you, when we talk about our interaction with our kids, I am much less patient with my son than I am my two daughters. That's just, I mean, that's not very spiritual, but I am. And, uh, I, you know, one of the things that um, someone said to me or mentioned one time is, do you remember what it's like being a 14-year-old boy? So then I started thinking, like, man, I was a lot like he is. It was crazy. He didn't even know me when I was that age. But I'm a lot like he is. I was a lot like he is now. And so thinking through some of that really has helped me in my interactions and dealings with him in times where I have a tendency to lose patience. Or maybe in the past I would have lost uh, patience in the expression of that in my life and it would have, uh, you know, created some tension in our relationship. And my wife, it's the other way, it's so funny how the dynamic of marriage works and with your kids because my wife is more patient with him and less patient with the girls. Yeah. Huh? I can't remember what it's like to be a 14-year-old girl. I never was. My wife does. And so you, you have this whole dynamic and this, this, whole, um, this whole scene that plays itself out in your lives. And for me, remembering how I used to be as a kid has helped me in those circumstances. And we're not talking about just tolerating something. You know, sometimes your kids do something and you tolerate it in the moment, let it go and move on. But the definition of tolerate is to put up with. And I don't know if you're like I am, but if I have something that I'm just putting up with, that I'm just tolerating, that's not going to be very sustainable. There's going to come a time where I'm not going to put up with it any longer. So when we look at patience, patience transcends tolerance. Because patience, as it's defined and used in the context of Scripture, it means this. It is endurance when circumstances are difficult. It's not just putting up with. It's not a temporary sense of just, um, you know, not saying anything or hoping a moment passes, but it is endurance in difficult circumstances. And as we look through today and the different circumstances, 
there are a couple of different ways that I want to look at how patience can be expressed in our lives. One of those ways is in our circumstances and the difficult times that we find ourselves in. And perhaps we have found ourselves in in the past. Perhaps some of you are in difficult circumstances right now, whatever that may be. And if you're not, the chances are it won't be very long before you find yourself in some type of difficult circumstance. And as a believer, as someone who has put their faith in Jesus, I think it's important for us to remember the same thing that Paul remembers as he expresses it here in 2 Timothy. Look at what he says. Now, you followed my teaching, my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Now, I don't think it's very bold of me to stand up here and say that many of you can think back and remember times in your life where you were going through a difficult circumstance. And whatever that was at the time, you felt a lot of pressure, you felt a lot of, uh, of outside influence and a lot of things coming in and out of your, your circumstances and situations. And you look back and you see how God rescued you in those moments. And God rescued you through those moments and through those times. And so when we find ourselves perhaps now in difficult circumstances, we can look back on those moments as Paul remembers the different times where he was under persecution and suffering. And he made it evident who he put his trust in and who he knows and believes rescued him through that. And that was the Lord. And the same is true in our lives, and I believe in order for us to, to in, in, endure during difficult circumstances, it's important for us to remember those times in our lives when God rescued us. Because otherwise we may find ourselves turning to different uh, outlets or different sources for rescue and hope in those moments and in those times where we're feeling pressure and difficulty. And uh, oftentimes it, it, it's um, easy because we're in the culture we're in to turn to things of this world for advice, whether it's a book or a TV show or someone with a, uh, a worldly view that they come in and give you man's philosophy and what sounds like a good idea by the world standards of how to get yourself out of those circumstances. And so often we try to apply some of those principles and some of those thoughts and some of those things that are happening in our lives. And we find ourselves just tolerating whatever it is and we can give up. And it may be a job. Maybe some of you are in that circumstance right now where you're in a job and you hate it and you're just tolerating it. It's going to be short-lived. Maybe you're in a relationship or you're at the tension and the tone of your relationship. You're just tolerating the other person for the time being. It's going to be short-lived. You're only going to put up with it for so long. But patience transcends tolerance because the love that is poured out into our hearts expresses itself in those circumstances and in those relationships and allows us to endure through those difficulties. And it's not just circumstances in our lives. It's not just the things that happen around us, whether we get ourselves into it or we, we have other influences that come in, that patience um, it, it can express itself or not in our lives. Because there are interactions with people that are difficult, where uh, sometimes our patience is tried. And there are two kinds of people, I say two kinds, two different groups of people that I want to talk about today as it relates to what we're talking about in patience and enduring through difficult circumstances. And we're going to look at enduring through difficult people. Because one of those groups of people are people that don't believe the same as we do. They have not put their faith in Jesus. And so you see them interact in society, and you see them in our culture, and you see them in our world, and the things that they say, and the things that they do, and the way they respond, and, and the, the, how they interact with one another. And it's different from what you believe as a believer one should treat someone else. 
And so we look at them and, and we begin to judge them, we begin to condemn them, we begin to think differently of them, and, and we, uh, it affects our patience with them and our relationships. And I believe just as it's important for us to remember what God has done in our lives, I believe it's important for us to remember who we used to be. Just as Paul expressed here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at what he says. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Such were you prior to your faith in Christ. Blasphemer, persecutor, liar, adulterer, fornicator. All those other things that summarize who you were as a person prior to coming to Christ. Paul says, I was this way. And Paul was as religious a person as you could have found in that time. He, he was uh, the cream of the crop when it came to the religious leaders. And after he put his faith in Christ, Paul remembered how he used to be, who he used to be, what defined his life. And his remembering of that gave him the patience and the endurance in his ministry in the times of difficulty and circumstances, dealing with difficult people, to persevere through that. When the unbelievers were persecuting him as a result of his faith, he remembered he was the same way. He persecuted the believers as well. And he had patience in dealing with them. He endured under those difficult circumstances. But if I'm going to be completely honest with you here today and just absolutely transparent, this is one of those things that's been really hard for me. And I don't know if any of you have the same kind of background and upbringing as I've had. If you're from this area, perhaps there are some of you who have. We're here in the Bible Belt. We're in this region where church is important. Getting up and going to church and being at church and being involved in church, the emphasis is on activity and uh, participation. And so many of you, like I was, I was born one day, and then the very next Sunday I was in the nursery. And then I was in church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and every other time in between the doors were open from the time I was born until I got into college. Every week I was there without question. So I grew up around the church. I grew up in the church. I grew up ingrained in the church culture. And there became a point in my life where I accepted Christ early on. And I never acted like a blasphemer or a persecutor or I would tell lies but I didn't think I considered myself a liar certainly wasn't a fornicator at that point but I look back and I think I was a pretty good kid a pretty good person during that time I did what I was supposed to do for the most part I acted you know I honored my parents by you know following their rules and obeying them for the most part. So I have a hard time remembering who I was prior to my relationship with Christ because I didn't know who I was prior to. I was a good kid, but I was no different than the person who accepts Christ at 40 years old and up to that point lived a life that would be categorized as a scoundrel and a heathen. And someone that you wouldn't want your kids or your family members having anything to do with. Some of you perhaps are in that boat where you came to know Christ later in life. And so you understand this passage that Paul is saying where he says, I once was this, but by the grace and mercy of God and through the love and faith of Christ, that's not who I am anymore. And so for you, perhaps it's not as, as hard to remember that and to be more patient 
with those who you come in contact with who aren't believers, who are saying and acting and doing and being a different way than what you think is right. But for all of us, because this is what has, I really believe this is a large part of what has helped me grow in my uh, understanding and the expression of patience in dealing with an unbelieving world. Because I still have those old thoughts of, you know, self-righteousness and pride that rear its ugly head of, you know, growing up in church world. But I think for all of us, remembering who we were, but also knowing who God is. Knowing who God is and knowing the character and the nature of God. Because if you believe that God has put his spirit in your heart, whether you would express it in certain terms or not, you believe that God has put his character in you. And as we talked about, bearing fruit is the outflow of what's inside. So your understanding of God is vital to what comes out. Because if you believe that God is harsh and impatient and condemning and judgmental, then what you're going to produce is impatience and harshness and condemnation and being judgmental. But if you understand the character and nature of God and who God is as this loving father, as Peter reminds us in this instance here, I think this is important as we're talking today and especially dealing with our interactions with those who don't believe the same way we do. Look at what uh, Peter says here. Second Peter, do not let this one fact escape your notice. Now, I want to be clear on this, and I, I want these words to jump off the page when you read it. He doesn't say, I think this, or, you know what, this is just my opinion. He says, this is a fact. This is a fact. He said, look, don't let this fact escape you. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some may count slowness, but is patient toward you. And he's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Understanding God is a God of patience. And he is patient with you. And he is patient with an unbelieving world. Just like he was patient with you prior to your coming to Christ, he has put that character and that spirit in you. Because the hard thing for us so often, and for me, I have found myself saying this prayer. I see things that are going on around me. I see the way culture seems to be trending. And I, I have prayed in the past... Dear Lord, please send Jesus back right now. Take me out of this craziness. Anybody else said that prayer before? Lord Jesus, come quickly, like now. If I'm being honest, that's the easy way out. Because it's easier to ask Jesus to just rapture us out of this world than it is for me to engage in a culture that believes differently than I do, that uh, acts differently than I do, that says things differently than I believe. That's easier to just ask God to remove us from it and let him deal with the, the fallout of their own decisions. But knowing and understanding that God is a God of patience and his desire is that none perish, that spirit is in us. And our prayers should shift from, Lord Jesus, come take me out of this place, to God, Ephesians 1.18. God, I pray that the eyes of my heart would be open to who I am as a patient child of yours and that I would see others the way you see them. That changes things because now I see the opportunity and the time that we're still here as God has ordained whatever happens from this point forward, the days, the weeks, the months, the years, from the beginning of time, we're here. 
And we're going to be interacting with those who do not believe the same way that we believe. And in order for us to express patience in those moments, it's important for us to remember who we were and to remember who God is. And that's true not only in, um, in dealing with unbelievers and in our interactions and relationships, but it's also true in our interaction and in our conversation and in our relationships with those who do have the same belief as we do. Specifically, that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. And that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess Christ as Lord, then you'll be saved. That's the simplicity of salvation that we believe. And you probably have many friends and families who don't attend Heritage who believe the same thing, that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. But the reality of it is not all of us are at the same place in our journey of faith and our understanding of the truths and the wisdom and the knowledge of Christ. And not all of our, the, not everyone's eyes of their hearts have been opened to the same thing at the same time. And if I'm being honest still, which I trust you hope I would be, this is another difficult um, dynamic for me in my life, has been, in how I respond to others and where they are in their journey. Because just as important as it is to remember what God has done and to remember who I used to be, I believe it's also important to remember where I used to be after I put my faith in Jesus. Because there have been times where I I didn't understand certain things. And I didn't, uh, I wasn't aware of some of the things that I believe today. And make no mistake about it, I do believe that we are called to move beyond the elementary teachings of our faith. That we're called to get past, some people are satisfied with just being saved and then holding on until Jesus gets here. But we're called to move beyond those elementary teachings just the foundations of our faith to grow in our knowledge and understanding of Christ and what God has done in us so that it may be an expression outwardly in our lives. But if we know that the Spirit of God is in us and that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one, then I believe that it can help us to know and understand how we can interact because we can look back at Jesus and how he interacted with those who had questions about faith, who didn't understand some of the things they were talking about. Because I know many of you perhaps have come to um, an, an enlightenment in a sense or the eyes of your heart being open. I keep saying that because uh, it's a, a greater awareness of what's already been done in you. And some of you have, are a little bit further in your journey in that understanding than some others. And so you talk to them and and you want it for them more than they seem to want to grow and progress in their faith and their understanding. And you've heard the phrase, um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, you can also um, try to lead a horse to water and he'll resist even getting to the water because he doesn't understand the value and the benefit and the, the, the path that you're taking him on to get to the water. Same is true in our circumstances and our interactions with other believers. Because you may be somewhere that someone else isn't, so how are we to respond in that? I want to go to John chapter 3. And I want to look at this, uh, this situation with Jesus and this circumstance he finds himself in. And uh, the very beginning of the chapter, it says there's this man of the Pharisees. So he was part of this religious culture. He was a good churchgoer. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. That's important for a couple of reasons, but we know that he's he's wanting to know a little bit more about this Jesus guy, about who he says he is, but he's doing it under the cloud of darkness so as to not be seen because he knows the persecution and the ridicule and the ousting that may follow 
if anybody else sees him coming to see Jesus. It says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God. This is Nicodemus talking to Jesus. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, uh, 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 how, <laughs> how can a man be born again? I mean, uh, he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Like, wh what are you talking about, Jesus? This is, doesn't even make any sense. Jesus responds, and he says, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed I said this to you. You must be born again. Nicodemus said, Ah, Jesus, I hear you saying those things, but how can this be? I don't get it. I, I'm, I'm not picking up on this. And Jesus said, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? And I believe the spirit and the gentleness and the heart with which he said it was with patience and understanding. And a little bit later, we have the passage, John three sixteen that we all are so familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. Now because of his interaction with Nicodemus he could have ridiculed him. He could have been harsh with him. He could have been um, frustrated with him because he wasn't getting what he, what he wanted him to understand. We know a little bit later that Nicodemus comes to, to faith in Christ. How do we know that? Uh, because John chapter 19, verse 39, this is after Jesus was crucified. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, so we know it's the same Nicodemus, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight worth. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So what he came in un looking for understanding and, and insight into Jesus in the, the cloud of darkness and the cover of darkness in the daylight, he's expressing his faith in Christ and taking him from being crucified to giving him a proper burial and honoring and recognizing his lordship. And I believe if we can remember where we have been along the path of our journey of faith and we know and understand that the Holy Spirit is guiding all of us as believers along this path because it's not our job to force someone somewhere they don't want or they're not ready to be. Jesus makes that explicitly clear in John 16. Look at what he says regarding the Holy Spirit. But when he, not Matt, not you, not your mom or dad or your grandma or your childhood preacher, the Spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you. I think part of the problem in the disconnect with our relationship with the Holy Spirit is we look at it as something spooky and this hokey thing this it, and we don't see it as a relationship with a person that has been poured into our hearts by whom we have been sealed because of our faith in Christ. It says he will guide you into truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. We have something that we say here at Heritage all the time. You may get tired of hearing me say it, but for some people, they hear it for the first time, and I'm going to say it until someone talks to you and it just spits out of your mouth about what we're about at Heritage. We say that we believe our job is to love people in a way that makes them curious about Jesus. Your job is not to convict them of any sin in their lives. Your job is not to condemn them if there's no condemnation in Christ, then there can't be any condemnation in Matt. Your job is not to take them somewhere where you're not, ready, you're not ordained or called to take them and they're not ready to go. Your job, my job, our job is to love 
people in a way that makes them curious about Jesus. We love unbelievers in a way that makes them curious about wanting, put it, wanting to put their faith in Jesus. We love believers in a way, patiently loving them in a way that makes them curious about who they are in Christ and what it is that you know and understand about who you are in Christ. And I, the crazy thing, I think some people think different people get a different spirit or a different uh, portion of the spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was in Paul, Peter, the early church leaders, the same Holy Spirit that's been, whatever religious or, or um, believing leader or author you follow or read after or pastor you watch or do you respect whoever it is the same holy spirit that's in all of them that's in me is in you it's the same holy spirit and that spirit as jesus promised will guide all of us into truth and so when we remember what it is that god has done as he rescued us out of circumstances and we remember who we were prior to our relationship with Christ. And we remember where we were along any point in our journey of faith. I believe it allows us to be open to the Holy Spirit reminding us about who we are as patient children of God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you did through your son, Jesus. Father, that um, because of our faith in your work through Jesus on the cross, you gave us your spirit and put it in our heart. And your Holy Spirit, he guides us and, and he opens our eyes to the truth of who we are. Father, I pray that as we leave here today and we continue to navigate through this series, God, I pray the eyes of our hearts are enlightened to the truth of who we are and of what you've already done in us. And specifically this week, God, as we maybe find ourselves in difficult circumstances or in difficult conversations or interactions with people uh, wherever they are. Father, that we're reminded by your spirit of the things that you've done, of who we were, and of where we've been. And I pray that the fruit of the spirit bears itself in patience in our interactions as we love others and we point them to your son, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.